It is a pleasure to me to introduce Jose Luis Bonalzazo. I will tell you who he is now. I have to say that after the very interesting presentation we have just heard from Ernst van Alphen, we must clarify that Jose Luis Bonalzazo in principle is not an artist, although we can talk further about this later. Jose Luis is um, also a PhD on documentation in Salamanca and it has a degree on uh, documentation by the same university professor of the Facultad de Ciencias de Documentation, Science and Communication by the University of Extremadura, specifically in the Information and Communication Department, and he's been a professor since 1995. He's also author of various titles related to archival practice, and he pays special attention to archival description. He's also author of Normalized Archival Description and co-author of Serious Levels course on archiving and documentation and advanced studies on archival science. We don't have Jose Luis here to talk about archival description, but rather he will be talking about another different type of systematic study and it is very much related with one of the topics we're working on, which is the notion of document throughout history. So, um, you have the floor, and I'll just sit down over there to listen to you. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Before I start, I would like to congratulate all the people who have participated in the organization of this symposium for the excellent results and outcome they are obtaining. And I would like to thank, of course, the scientific committee for their very friendly invitation, Pilar and Silvia. But I also want to extend this um, thank you to Reme Jorge Mela because of all this. I would also like to thank Laia Lisendre, who has been on top of all the different management issues. It is a pleasure for me here to be here today, and it is so because of several reasons. The list of reasons kept growing these days, uh, by the way. And firstly, for allowing me to enjoy this event. This is the main reason, and that's essential but also because I owe a lot to the city, to this land, for many years. I started in the world of uh, quality in higher education, thanks to the work with the Quality Agency of the University of Catalonia. And I owe a lot of my professional career since 2014 or 2015 when we um, credited for the first time the Masters on Archival Studies in the Autonomous University of Barcelona. So I owe my, a lot of my career to that collaboration. Also because suddenly I realized that it was not my first job, but almost it was in the Casa Museo Unamuno in a museum many, many years ago. Let's not go into those details. And fourthly, and the list could continue growing, it has also allow, allowed me to find one of my best friends here in this land. So the title of the symposium is Archiving, Exhibiting. And as we can see that, I would like to leave the plot behind. I am very disciplined, so I would like to follow. But I would like to change the title of the symposium I would like to talk about exhibiting and archiving because I would like to talk about the way archive is exhibited in art and the way the archive document is represented in art. All this through the National Gallery works because of some reasons we will mention later. We will structure the presentation in four big blocks or sections and I will now start. The documents kept in museum archives are a reference source not only for the study of art and museums and evolution and history, but the collections themselves. In recent years, 
various milestones such as the creation of Museum Archives Network, the development of projects between the networks, this collaboration between the Picasso Museum and MENAC, for instance, is a clear example of the situation as well, the creation and development of projects for the dissemination of collections, the development of technical instruments, catalogues, inventories, appraisal tables, and the holding of study days, such as the one that took place in 2019, or this exceptional one that is taking place in Barcelona here these days, have provided an important boost to the promotion of museum archives. The contribution of archival documents to the study of art is unquestionable, but this is what I would like to set forth. But what can art contribute to the study of archival documents? And can works of art be used as a source for the study of these documents? Works of art of a visual nature, particularly paintings, in this case, regardless of their aesthetic values, have the property of transmitting explicitly or implicitly information about the society in which they were created, as they often present an image of the functions and activities of the people and institutions of that society. At the same time, it should be noted that in the exercise of these functions and activities, documents are often generated or used. In this sense, art such as literature can provide information, objective information, and I would dare to say not interpretative or subjective on the facts of the past. It is true that the evolution of iconic languages makes interpretation of images more difficult. And also the fact that we live in a society that traditionally has given more value to text than image, so written documents more than visual documents. How are the different types of sources used together and jointly can provide a complementary view of the same object of study? Uh, we have already talked and I have, have to say that the image of the archive of archival documents or even the archival professionals has been approached by numerous authors in order to assess the social perception of archives based on literary sources. There are some works based on the presence of archive in art, especially the work of Claire Autour from the year 2000, which is this first approach to seeing archives through art. There are many works, as has been pointed out, based on literature, and not just to mention a few, and even more so the ones in cinema, because we have such an amount of references, especially to documents. I dare to say that in almost all films that we see, we find references of this kind. So. Just to mention some sources, I would like to talk about Vicenta Portes analyzing the image of archive in three films, and more recently, Ramon Alberg, Rocío Ponce, on the image of literary and audiovisual archivers. There's some works, Madison 2017, actually, how of how archive documents were shown in a musical in Hamilton, a Broadway musical by well, Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers of the US. Mm -hmm. In general speak, generally speaking, these are qualitative works, some reflexive, and some are also quantitative. In this context, the main aim of this presentation and this work I have prepared specifically for 
this symposium, the main goal, as I was saying, is to analyze the way in which archival documents have been represented throughout history in works of painting in Western Europe in order to determine the purpose for which the documents are included in the works and consequently to appreciate the perception that may have existed about them. So to this end, we have opted to use a content analysis methodology which is based on Wimmer and Dominic guidelines and Bardin on some previous work we had done of a similar nature organized in six phases. The first phase was oriented towards defining the scope of the study, which is what I just pointed out when talking about the objective. The second phase focused on the selection of the data source and after evaluating the possibility of using the image banks of different museums, we assess the possibility of using the image bank of Menac, but there's still some images missing and that is why we couldn't do the work on that source as I would have liked. So we opted for or going for the National Gallery, essentially because of two reasons. The first one because of the size of the collection. It has around 2,300 works and it was uh, an accurate scope for us since I had the conversation with Bilad around November so that we could have enough time for me to come to Barcelona. The volume of works was as reasonable as, reasonable as to us to approach the study. Secondly, because of the characteristics of the Bank of Images of the National Gallery. It is possible to uh, check the information about artists. This is quite common in museums. It has quite a good search engine and I must acknowledge or say that, well, it includes key data, a short description, an external description, or rather an extended description, the possibility to download the image, and more importantly, the possibility to study the image with a great deal of detail and quite a high resolution. This does not necessarily happen in other museums. So we are going to focus now in this bank of images as a source of reference. A third phase was devoted to the selection of the works to be analyzed. We chose to carry out a search. The search engine has a tiny problem, which is that every time we access it, it executes the search in a different way. In other words, the outcomes appear in a random manner. So we had to choose and launch the engine for a few days. On December, the computer in my office was locked down in my office. No one was allowed to touch it. You know, when you are in register 2000, if someone shuts this down, you're dead. So we assessed the different registers and we chose the ones where an image of a document appeared. And as I said before, we went through more than 2000 images and we chose 226 pieces representing representations of documents which stands for 10% of the total. We believe this to be a representative volume which coincides with the percentage of previous works that we had carried out. The fourth stage consisted on defining the content categories this took place simultaneously to the previous stage. The content analysis is based on structuring information, allocating it a structure on the basis of several categories. We defined five categories, one genre, two context, three documentary type, four 
level of representation or relevance of the document and level of detail. In turn, I mean, gender was considered an open category, but finally, seven subcategories were listed religious painting, costumerism, genre painting, portrait, allegory, and and yet another one <laughs> functional context these we considered to be relevant still live was the other one the last category so we defined yet eight subcategories religious activities everyday life art literature music professions and trade military scientific mythological and one last blog which did not correspond to a functional use case but rather the use of documents appearing in works to help identify the author of the work it's a form of metadata on the work on the piece itself the third category documentary type was considered an open category and the four one level of representation was based on Barbara Craig and James O'Toole work looking at archives through art and when I say it was based on it I say it because we altered the subcategories due to a problem that we had spotted in a previous work we tried to define the relevance of the document within the work and we defined seven or five levels rather easy accessible documents with no import no, no significant importance related documents the use of documents the reading of documents fourthly a fourth profound level document documents como objetos principales de la obra. Y de forma paralela, basándonos también en, en, en la propuesta de, de Craig y Otul. On Craig, he's... And, sorry, there was a little bit of an interference. So, the document was represented in a much more detailed manner, or with so much detail that it was even possible to read the text in the documents. The ulterior stage consisted on the systematic gathering of information on the selected works. For that we used an Excel document with the reference of the work, because, you know, consulting the images has been a recurrent task, title, author, date, century, which allowed us to carry out an analysis of the chronological evolution, a short description that might be interesting to us and the five analysis categories pictoric genre level of representation and degree of detail the five categories that we mentioned before and last based on this excel document it was quite easy to carry out the quantitative analysis of data. It is true that I have cut my presentation short. My presentation was super long. It consisted of 74 slides, so it was quite impossible in 20 minutes, so I had to cut it short. And after lunch, I have even cut it shorter. And nonetheless, it's still long. Let me alert you on that. So why don't I share now a few outcomes? We have reached the conclusion that 80.62% of selected items correspond to the 226 obras in which there are documents, in 183, the 80% 80% is framed in those centuries. We were expecting figures of centuries 13 and 14 as reduced. We were 
uh, surprised by the 18th century, so small, and 19th century could have an institutional explanation. But we do see there a main core, and as for genres, and this will be the only matter we can look at with greater detail, we appreciate as follows. Religious paintings, we see that in 12th, 13th century, something that we expected, and we saw that very clearly. But we see especially 15th and 16th centuries with a volume of works presenting documents is bigger, greater, the presence of documents in paintings is higher. In the case of costumism, it's so, so logical, but this genre, most works with uh, document representations are in centuries 17 and 18. And portraits, which is the third genre with the highest number of documents, with 21.24% of the total, we can see that is especially in 15, 16, and 17 centuries is the um, time of work showing documents. These are the great three great genres that predominate religious with 49.6% John gender or John uh, painting and portraiture with the 21.24%. The rest of genres um, historical, mythological, allegory, still life, as I was saying before, which is quite surprising, it had all whole values below 3%. So, at least it caught my attention, but this is something that I will talk about in my conclusions. Historical painting, which could be a type of painting where we find documents to allude to historical documents, presents a small volume. And this is striking because the document that is shown in art is a document that is related partly to the day-to-day -day life. So we can talk about three big stages. The first one when there's document in religious painting, a second one in the 17th century where we find documents in all genres that we've detected, and then centuries 18 and 19 where there is predomination of document in works of, well, portraits and costume prismo. But let's go to the works and let's play around with this polyedric effect explained by Professor Ramon Albert this morning. Religious painting. It is true that in religious painting, documents appear in multiple contexts but are essentially used with three purposes. We can at least point out that they are used with the purpose of attributing or with attributing purposes so as to help and identify characters or characteristics of characters with communicative purposes as well so trying to convey a message in the same way as a document does so or with informative purposes on the work or the author itself documents as attributes of individuals are shown as a reflection of many um, biblical characters, the list is vast, and they oftentimes help in their identification. And this role of being attributes of people is already found in works in the 13th century, like the Virgin and baby Jesus, where we see the image of the uh, boy with um, parchment or scroll in his hands, like the transfer of New Testament, that's how we can interpret it. And this image here is repeated in this diptych in Hungary, exactly the same. The boy has a scroll in his hand. And in this fantastic Virgin Mary um, altarpiece, is very common to see numerous, well, of course, same representation of the apostles, but in this 
piece we find that documents are also used with another purpose or role not as an attribute of the characters but rather in one of the tables in this one um, signers say from a shipwreck we see a bishop here we don't know who he is but we can identify him as a bishop with a document unscrolled document in his hand and there's a message you will flee death if you celebrate the party of the conception of the version this is a document to communicate a message to communicate something and this is repeated essentially with the figure of saint john the baptist we find the same image a uh, character with an unrolled scroll in the hand perfectly readable a biblical quote here and the image repeats itself saint john the baptist i would say is the more, most portraited character with documents there's over 30 representations of this type and as i was saying this role of communicating and conveying a message is repeated we see this in some examples some other examples a document with the same message although it is not clearly checked but there's this same message with the extendable document with the particularity that the text is indicated lengthwise and it continues on and on until it becomes a representation of the saint and we can see that the message appears once again with a document in his hand the unrolled document to convey the externos day this is the starting of the representation but i do must point out that this role of communicating a message or attributing a character is altered and keeps changing here we find this specificity once again saint john the baptist unrecognizable unless we notice the document as such and out of curiosity it has the name of the author Andreas Mandini and here on the inside it is indicated in the inner part of the document and that role of character attribute is maintained during the Baroque and is essential for identification we it would we would find it very difficult to identify saint john the De, the baptist in this garden um if it were not for something he'd hidden which is precisely the attribute of saint and a third role documents appear in images as well as the informative element informative document on the work itself like a kind of metadata of the work sometimes the cards are shown like something external to the work in 1465 1465 Antonello de Messina painted this so this allows us to know things about the author himself and this is a document included in the works itself as we can see here but you can see it perfectly well bartolomeus rubius in the portuguese sense of the world bartolomeo bermejo is the author of this work let's go to costume brusmo this type of painting we can see that Construbismo comes into the day-to-day -day life of people essentially in three things, in commercial scenes, musical scenes, um, daily life scenes, or family life scenes, a very clear example. Two, tax collectors, the main document, one of the collectors, is um, registering financial data on this accounting book we can see it very clearly 
But not only this, but in the work we can also see the file and where we see it, we see the archive itself. There's a cabinet and several documents on top of it, except for something that seems to be tied up. But, well, sometimes we see this image that is uh, communicated in the cinema, Ramon was saying this morning, but we can perfectly appreciate the character of the documents, the stamps, etc. And this idea appears in other works as well. I'm introducing now this man here, the greedy man, and it's the exact same image, the link between the document and the money, and some images that are very similar. But there are some other professions as well. These are four officials of, um, well, another profession and this astronomer with his notebook or this girl, this young girl teaching a little boy. A second field where we see documents in these costume brismo scenes are musical scenes, uh, some of a romantic nature such as this one, but there are some other uh, scenes in a pub or a tavern, these musicians play in a pub, and we have the peasant girl with the documents in her hand, and there is also music, cabinet music, uh, cult scenes where we can read this uh, sonat for Baal. So these are all linked to music, but very different atmospheres. And finally, in the day-to-day -day life of people, we see numerous representations of documents. This official reading out a letter is a clear scene. The scene reflects a man dictating a letter to a man, and we can think, or we may think, that this is a letter related to war topics and well it seems that that is not the case given what we can appreciate yes I'm almost, I'm almost done okay in the well together we see the card with a heart right next to the paw of a dog that seems to indicate that this is a love letter and not a military letter they're numerous in family settings and personal settings, some of them quite mysterious, some of them are hidden, such as this uh, family breakfast by Janet Yaldeta, where we see a small document showing from a drawer, and we will finish with the portraits very finally. Uh, very frequently we see works to identify the portraited character. Here I have a few selection, there's a few more, but there's this portrait of Francesco Marco Barbarivo, son of the respectable Dux Francesco, and it is, he's writing to London, that's how we see it at the bottom, and there's numerous letters that are truly giving us information about the person in the portrait, and there's another role, an additional role, which is to identify the author, not the person in the portrait, but this is King Anna Maria de Austria of Austria, and she's in mourning, and we can see uh, her sending a letter to the author, so the relationship with the author. There's always a link with the people, with the topic that is in the portrait. And even if it's not there, we can still imagine such as these two young people separated by two centuries, but they have a very clear link. Okay, so we will now finish, I promise. Some conclusions. Um, documents are not an accessory element they always have a role attributes to transfer uh, convey information etc there's a communicative role but then the informative part takes over since the 16th century there is something that is relevant which is linked to the daily activities of people and i would like to point out that throughout time 
the artistic creation works have reproduced the relationship between what conceptual models of description and current metadata plans collect agents that have actions that are shown in the documents this has been the model of creation during a long time and also in present times but I understand that technological development of technologies and the social change that is taking place we are talking more about data instead of documents and this is altering the reality and we may have in some years we may have I know that I'm not going to be invited to back to the symposium because I've gone over my time but I would have to change my subject of study in the future and replace documents with data and traditional paintings with data-driven works of art. Thank you very much and sorry once again.